So just to start off with, I'd like to just kind of give a big picture of what a program looks like. I'd like to describe a program as a broad-based program. We do everything from uh, apply called for development to breeding methods research, basically trying to figure out how to breed soybeans faster and more efficiently, more effectively. You know, we do studies on that, we publish those studies and other studies that hopefully other plant breeders and soybean breeders can, can learn from and apply to their own programs. We also work with a lot of other researchers on a genetic basis of economically important traits. So for example, I work with one of my colleagues, Bob Sukar, at the University of Minnesota, and we're very interested in identifying mapping genes that control resistance to iron deficiency chlorosis. So we're pretty excited about one of chromosome five that we think we can pinpoint and that will tell us a lot about how the soybean plants uh, uh, how the soybean plant basically achieves resistance to IBC and maybe something we can modify in the future. Oh and finally I'll mention that we are an important source of graduate student education. And at any given time in our program, we have between three and six or seven graduate students working on plant breeding. And those graduate students graduate and they go out to typically the private sector and work on developing varieties for all of you. And oh, I can't go back. Sorry. <laughs> Hope you memorized all that. I was just going to make a little more points. Uh, our mission, our overall mission, of course, is to enhance the economics of soybeans in Minnesota. And we have a bunch of you know, sub missions under that related to research on the things I described in, in graduate student education. So, with regard to the specific projects that were funded uh, for by Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council, right now we have um, three projects, or a PI of three projects. A PIM project that's simply titled Soybean Breed and Genetics. I manage a project called Advancing Viral Resistance to Soybeans in Santa Cruz, Minnesota. And I also PI on a project related to the Soybean Research Center at the University of Minnesota. I'm not going to talk about this third one in much detail, but it's just a little bit of funding that allows us to get some admin support and some other support to bring together the 20 some soybean researchers on campus into one center so we can more easily attract. Uh, connect those labs together so you have better synergy with one another. So, if you have any questions about that, I'd be very happy to answer them at the end of the talk. So, first of all, here, oh, the other thing I want to mention is that we also have kind of outside the research production action team umbrella, we also have what's called a high impact project for Minnesota Soybean. And this has to do with developing high oil uh, varieties. And I'll mention that real briefly too because I think that's uh, quite pertinent these days. I like, what's this thing here? Is that what you've been doing the whole time? Yes. Okay. Well, that's okay. It's all good. Yeah. Sure. Sorry, sorry. <clears throat> so, with regard to the first project that's simply titled Soybean Reading and Genetics, the way I view this project is, is that's sort of the cornerstone of a lot of our research. It's, a, it's a, a grant that we can rely upon and build upon. And so I, I think about it as the foundational funding for our program. And we take that foundational funding that you know, uh, funds some basic staff time and some field time and some equipment and things like that, or rental equipment. So you have a breeding program. And we can take that breeding program and we can leverage that to get lots of funding from other places. We leverage that breeding program and it makes us attractive to get funding from the United Soybean Board. We can leverage it and get funding from the USDA. We even leverage that breeding program and receive funding from NSF in the form of a postdoctoral fellowship. So lots of different sources come together to create this machine that's a breeding program, and then that breeding program then can, can, can basically be that tool or that machine that can uh, address problems in soybean genetics and breeding and also uh, uh, facilitate interactions among other researchers on campus. Uh, doing things related to soybean genetics and soybean improvement in general. So that's the way I view this project. And in terms of uh, specific traits that we choose parents in our breeding program for, we have a wide array of traits. Of course, the yield is always number one, yield is always number one for soybean. And on top of that, of course, we want early maturity for uh, adaptation to Minnesota, phosphorus resistance. Stress resistance traits, we're particularly interested in IBC, soybean aphids, soybean systematode. And then on the quality side, uh, we become more interested in high oil for reasons I will explain. 
And then we also have some specialty type soybean breed programs that program too for those smooth type soybeans that some growers, uh, especially in this area, grow for premium uh, for export to the markets like Asia. Uh, in terms of our overall breeding pipeline, um, you know, I guess at a really high level, this is what a soybean breeding program looks like. We start out with a large number of breeding candidates in a program. In the process, we generate lots and lots of progenies, up to tens of thousands of progenies in our program. And then we slowly whittle those progenies away through increasingly, uh, an increasing level of uh, intensity of evaluation. So as things move through the breeding pipeline, they get tested at more locations, they get tested for uh, more stress resistance to various stresses and quality traits and so forth. And so we increase the intensity of selection for various characteristics, and then as we do that, we whittle away the number of, of candidates in our reading program, and hopefully at the end we're left with something that uh, has a, a home someplace for some particular use and has good agronomics and yield as well. And um, so I guess if you break that green program down into uh, a higher resolution here, we have our population development phase where we're choosing parents, we're making crosses, we're creating green populations, performing inbreeding to, uh, to ensure that those, those plants coming out of those populations are now true breeding so we can create pure lines, which is a pure line cultivar type of crop. And then after our population development, we move into our uh, evaluation and selection phase. Where first we start off with throwing things in, in single rows, and then from there we bulk up seed, we go into first year yield testing at a couple of locations, second year yield testing at another location, I should say uh, three locations in the second year. And then after that, we moved into a series of regional trials where things are going to be tested at five to anywhere to 20 locations per, per year. So we really need that multiple years of testing across many locations to ensure that whatever comes out of our program has good stability and a good average performance across lots of different types of environments. And then alongside all of this, we also have to multiply seeds and purify seeds and create breeder seed. So we start off with, in order to do these multi-location tests, we have to have an appreciable amount of seed, so maybe 20, 30 pounds of seed to start off with. We have to create that seed, and at some point, and something looks really promising to purify that one. We have to make sure that it's not variable for flower color, essence color, height, or maturity, right? Because when you're a farmer, when you grow a variety, you want to make sure that every single plant in that variety is exactly the same, matures in the same day. So we have to go through a purification stage to make sure that's the case. And then after that, we will grow up what's called a cure increase and create what's called breeder seed. So about 100 to 200 pounds of nice, pure, clean seed. And if there's a, a place for that, that seed to go, we hand it off to Carl over here in the audience at Minnesota Crop Improvement Association, or maybe another private partner, and they would take that seed and blow it up into what's called foundation seed. So lots of years of testing and, and multiplication, and we can expedite that through um, increasing locations per year. We can expedite that through using offshore winter nurseries and things like that in the southern hemisphere. But that's about it. There's not a lot of technology that's going to get you around getting to do that much, much faster. It's just a biological, basic biological problem. For, we have um, a fairly good multi-location testing network. We have a few locations in the south, a few in central Minnesota, a nice uh, series of testing locations in, in northwest Minnesota that uh, is, you know, a few of those are made possible by the cooperation with the Crookston Station, northwest uh, research and outreach station up there to help us manage the weeds and take a few notes. And we have the site, the small site, far north is Rosso. So with regard to uh, actual variety development, I guess I already mentioned that these are some of our variety targets. Once again, we're interested in some specific types of stress resistance like aphids and SCN. And then we are in the business of a lot of different types of specialty soybeans. We're ranging from high oleic soybeans to black soybeans to tofu soybeans to nafta soybeans. So these specialty markets that command a premium that farmers can take advantage of. And Minnesota is actually, I believe, the number one uh, food grade soybean producer in the country, right, David? So. Yeah, so I'd like to keep it that way. 
So I just wanted to go through a few varieties we've released over the last couple of years that you're kind of interesting. You might enjoy hearing about regarding I'll talk about some specific food grade ones of interest. One specific one that we released <clears throat> in the last year or two is uh, we named Minnesota Decker. And this is an interesting variety because it actually has a nice black seed coat and it has a green pot of leaf. So it's you know, visually very, very different than anything else. Uh, it has what's called the low stone bean percentage. So it makes, it makes a nice food product for what these food these soybeans are used for. It has good water uptake and like I said, a nice uh, seed coat integrity. And relative to uh, these types of varieties, black seeds, green, green cotton beans, in the industry they call that green meat. So you have your yellow meat, you should be your typical yellow cotton bean variety, and your green meat, green meat soybeans. So you don't see many of these out there. Relative to these types of varieties, this one has actually pretty bad economics. So it's all relative, right, Carl? <laughs> so it's interesting, there's actually two genes that two genes that give that green cotton bean phenotype. And those two genes is basically a savory, savory phenotype. So the plant doesn't want to break down its chlorophyll. That's why the cotyledons stay green instead of turn yellow, like the plant normally would, to break down the chlorophyll. That also causes the problem with the plant uh, having the stay green stem too. So the, the plants like to stay green, their stem wants to stay green as well. So, but it is what it is. So you might be wondering what the heck do you use these things for? You can make different types of soybean uh, tofu, you can make black tofu out of these things. There's uh, you know, black soy milk you can drink. You can buy it in a powdered form for health benefits. You can buy green um, black beans with what they call green kernels, just full in the bag for your, your own home recipes. And they're really very much a health food. You know, you can have, uh, have high antioxidants. They're, Good for anemia, good for pregnancy, enhanced fertility, so can't go wrong with these things. Just thought I'd share that. We also, again, work in uh, natto soybeans. We've released a couple of varieties here um, over the last couple of years that are earlier maturity, one being the 0 0.1 relative maturity, one being the 0 0.3. Um, those have been taken up by a private company, and natto soybeans have really small seeds, a nice, perfectly clear hilum. Because if you have a black hyalin, a natto variety when you're eating natto, like in that dish right there, looks like you have insects in your natto, so you want to avoid that. So they have nice, perfectly clear yellow seeds. And uh, yeah, these ones pass the, the manufacturer's quality evaluations. So. And I have tried natto before, and it's, it's okay, it's an acquired taste. So something you might be more interested in would be our farters on our high lake soybean varieties. We've uh, developed a few of these over the last couple of years. One is interesting because it's about 1.5 relative maturity. And it's interesting uh, and has potential, some potential specific health benefits because it has a high lake level. So normal soybeans have about 25% oleic fatty acid. High lake soybeans have between 70 and 80% oleic acid. And that uh, provides a better shelf life, better stability in the fryer, um, and things like that. So you don't, you don't have to use trans hydrogenation and create trans fats to make a more stable oil. And there's also some benefits from a biodiesel standpoint. There's also now uh, reported some benefits from feeding these high oleic soybeans to dairies. Apparently, you get more milk fat when you, when you use high oleic soybeans in a roaster, a soybean roaster on a dairy farm, feed those to dairy cows. And so there's this. Dairy farms are interested in growing these and using these in their dairy operation. So there are a number of benefits, also maybe some potential aquaculture benefits. So the top one there is interesting because it has 70% uh, oleic, but it also has a high liver rank. All right, 7.4%, which would also uh, give you some better omega 3s in that oil and perhaps have some additional heart health benefits. And we have a couple others here that are, um, have really high oleic, hovering around 78%. And I uh, have really low limb leg for uh, you need an extended, better shelf and fryer life. So be about 1.9%. Typically, your limb leg and normal soybeans can be about 8 or 9%. So they're much reduced for limb leg and much, much elevated for high leg. We've been doing some trials with um, some cooperation from the United Soybean Board and some people working with them over the last few years. 
And they help us organize these private private TSI trials, multi-location trials. So every year these trials, we put our, all of our Ohio Lake varieties into those. And they can be anywhere from between seven and, and you know, 10 or 12 or 15 locations. So they're, they're a nice set of trials to put things into for one single year of data. And you can see that in this chart here, what I have plotted is yield on the y-axis and maturity dates on the x-axis. So typically, longer maturity varieties are going to have higher yield than shorter varieties because they have a longer time to, to uh, develop seeds and go through the reproductive cycle and just develop biomass. So there's tends to be a positive relationship between maturity dates and yield. And so you kind of just want to compare things that mature uh, at a very similar time. So you can see that our top one there, our HOLL-1, uh, does quite well in these trials relative to the checks, with the checks being in orange, the public check from Nebraska that's a good yielder in orange there, and there are a couple of pioneer checks there that uh, have a key there. I said the blinker on it. Splinter. Yeah. So the pioneer checks here starting with um, with key. Yeah, so they're a little bit earlier. You see our dash one did very well in these trials here in 2023. Our dash four, I guess, kind of hangs in there it's a few days earlier, as you'd expect to be earlier in relative maturity. And I guess the point I want to talk about here is that we have a new one that seems like it may have a niche, it's been doing well, uh, did well in these trials, did well in our own internal trials. And it's a little, it's nice because it's a little bit earlier. So this is about 1.4 RM. This is probably an early one, maybe 1.1 1 .1 or 1.2 RM, being very similar in maturity to this pioneer line right here. So this pioneer line is about 1.1. So it seems like um, we have something that's coming down the road that will be a little bit earlier in maturity and, and fill a nice niche with this high lake material. Your miss, I just had a nice picture of my even resistant material. Did you see it real fast? Did you see that one? <laughs> <laughs> There's some aphids on the, on the left and the one on the right didn't have any aphids. So, that we, have any, so we have some aphid resistant material in the program right now. Uh, licensed a couple of varieties here in the last, again, the last year or so, uh, that have these rag, these rag genes here. So one of those varieties, this, these are not those varieties, it's something different. But those varieties uh, have good aphid resistance. We have things that have multiple rag genes, and uh, there's some, there's a little bit of interest in those things out there too. So, so those are a few things. And then in terms of this year's breeder seed production, we had five new varieties in our breeder seed production phase. We had a couple aphid resistant things, uh, one that actually has stacked rag one, rag two aphid resistance. We have things further down the pipeline that have actually up to four aphid resistance sheets. So stacked four rags, which is really nice, which, which would give really durable resistance. The problem with aphid resistance is that it breaks down quite click quickly. You only have one rag gene. The, the variation of biotypes and aphids on the landscape will quickly overcome that. But if you have multiple rag genes, maybe three, four, I haven't seen five yet, so maybe five rag genes, uh, you'll hopefully have more durable resistance to, to uh, an evolving pest, quickly evolving pest. Uh, so I guess, yeah, so we have a couple of those, and we have a, a new Ohio Lake bean here that, that uh, we still need some more yield data on to really make um, so you get too excited about this, but the nice thing about this is it has high oleic, it has a yellow hilum, and also have, it has a little bit higher protein. So it may, it could possibly be dual purpose in terms of it could possibly fit a high oleic uh, use as well as maybe like a food grade use, perhaps like soy milk use or something like that. So that's kind of exciting and it also has SCM resistance. In terms of, um, so another thing that we do with this money is it helps to support our, our commercial variety trials. So you may or may not know that every single year our program uh, conducts a series of commercial variety trials. Companies will enter varieties into these trials for a fee and then we'll test them at three locations with three replications per location. And then we, we publish those results for everybody to see and so we like, so they're an unbiased source of information in terms of the relative performance of these different varieties. For yield, we also test for SCM resistance with an actual bioassay. And we actually take maturity dates, which is different than some, some private trials. Right? We, we actually go out and date things in terms of maturity. If you look at a lot of private trials, they just don't do that. They just report the RM from the seed company, and we have to take it as, as that. <clears throat> so we conduct these trials across the 
across the whole state here. And I guess a couple things I want to note is that maybe maybe we'll get some input out there on this question. I have this question in my mind. And the question is that should we keep doing these trials? At one point in time, these things serve a very important purpose, of course. But nowadays, uh, companies rely a lot upon their own data, and there are also private trials out there like the first trials. They do a very nice job, and they have lots of locations and lots of data, and they publish it very quickly. And it's a, a really good source of information. So I have a question mark uh, in my mind whether or not these things are worth doing, because I strongly believe that we in the public sector should be doing things that you know, complement the private sector and fill in gaps and be unique and not necessarily be redundant to what the private sector is doing. <laughs> so that's the question I have, and if you have any inputs on that, I'd be very happy to hear it. To, to be determined whether or not we continue these things or not. But the entries have been going down over time. And, I, and this is not just true here, but lots of different places, and I expect they'll continue to go down in the future. The other challenge I wanted to note is that you see a big gap here between Lamberton and our other locations up here. There is a, a research and outreach station here at Morris, but Morris is increasingly switching over to just using their land and resources for producing organic feed for their organic dairy there. And they're moving away from uh, doing small plot trials for crops like ours. So um, I guess that leaves us with a big gap here between Lamberton and I guess we have a private location here at Glendon. Our next research and outreach station will be up here at Kirkston. I'm concerned about this gap. Becker doesn't fill this gap because Becker is the Anoka sand plain. Of course, that doesn't really represent anything uh, like what Western Minnesota is like. So I guess I have a concern and also have a, an inquiry. If there's anybody out there who knows anybody who lives by Morris or if you live by Morris or someplace in central Minnesota, if you're willing to work with us in terms of hosting a trial, uh, please be in touch with me. I'd very much like to work with you. I want to briefly mention this high impact project on developing new high oil lines. This project has been going now for a couple of years, and so it's really in the early stages. As you know, developing a variety can take can take many, many years, and so this is uh, very much early days. But the reason for this is because of this increased interest in renewable diesel. The mandates out of California and to, to basically supply all the transportation fuel or the, the shipping fuel, trucking fuel with renewable diesel. And the amount of, of sodium oil that's going to be needed for meeting these renewable diesel demands out there is, is just is, is, is skyrocketing. And I think I saw some place by 2030, that the uh, gallons of renewable diesel that are expected to come online is going to be sixfold, or it is right now. 23 is not that far away. So there's lots of plants coming on. The capacity of this is greatly increasing. So we're moving from a situation where, when I, at least when I started here, we we're really concerned with protein. Everybody said, root for protein. We need higher protein, 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 protein. And then it seemed like overnight, all of a sudden, talking about oil. So oil now is driving the price of soybeans, and it will even drive the price of soybeans even further into the future. And so with that in mind, we need to start developing higher oil sodium varieties to help keep that demand. I think I, yes, three minutes? Okay, thanks, David. Um, I think I saw some place that uh, to meet this demand, we'll need about 18 or more million acres of soybeans in the country to meet this oil demand. So we could also develop varieties that have higher oil and, and help with that situation. Real quickly, we started making crosses in 2001, uh, specifically for this high oil project. We expedited, expedited some things and created some families real quickly. Uh, we pulled, um, we selected 860 F2, F3 families, as we call them, put them in single rows this last year, and selected a whole bunch of those just on the basis of uh, visual selection, vigor, sustainability, and maturity. And we're going to be looking at the oil content of all these things. And we selected all those families from an early population, because some early generation selection, as we call it in the business, uh, on individual F2 plants. And just to kind of show you the range of oil in a population like this, we have things that have like 16 or 17% oil, so pretty low. And in this population, we're finding things that have over 25% oil. So we'll see if that, so we'll see if we can maintain that, and we can find something that really does have that level of oil. But this is to this sort of show you the range of materials we use in a population like this we can take advantage of. And real briefly on the nematodes, um, we, uh, I 
guess uh, our, one of our objectives with the nematodes is to develop uh, non-8878 sources of, of nematode resistance. And uh, last year we released a couple of lines here that uh, have our PKing. So we have a new uh, 0.8 for ultimate maturity Minnesota line that has PKing resistance in it. And you can see that it has quite good yield compared to these checks here. And it does have good resistance. You can't see it right here because of this, this brown bubble. There's good uh, resistance to HG257, which would be the HG type that overcomes 8878 resistance. And so it has that, that good resistance that we would want. So that is available, and we've licensed that to some places for some breeding work. And just to show again what it actually does, you know, we, we can keep up in terms of yields. So we have a commercial variety class uh, that we did this last year. And last year, this day, we did really, really well in terms of percentage of the overall mean. And this year, it hung in there. You know, 106 relative to its, its maturity dates here, um, compared to these other lines here, uh, is very, very respectable among all these commercial varieties. And finally, we've been doing some testing of uh, virulence, virulence of HG type 2 SCN population on these commercial varieties uh, just to kind of validate their source of resistance because there are places that I make catalogs of, 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 of PK type resistant varieties, but nobody really validates those things. So we've been validating those things and publishing uh, validated varieties on, a, on our website. You can find those there. If you want more information about that, I'd be happy to provide it to you. So with that, I just want to uh, acknowledge my staff, Sonia City, Raphael, Jennifer Aguilero, and all my students and postdocs. And again, most of the support that I talked about today was provided by Minnesota Soybeans, so I'm greatly appreciative of all that support um, to allow us to conduct our research. And that's it. That's our group.